everybody? Lara's here. Lara Caso from Mass Audubon. Um, she is, a, I was looking you up. You have many, many different um, designations, ornithologist, biologist, educator. Um, so we're really lucky to have her. Today she's going to be talking about reptiles. And this is a talk and walk, so anyone who wants to join her on the trail after is welcome to. Thanks, Lara. Hi, everybody. Nice to see you all. Um, so yes, today I'm going to be talking about reptiles, um, which is pretty exciting. I really like reptiles. So we're going to do just a, a talk about reptiles and then we're going to, anyone who wants to join, we're just going to do a short walk along the trail. Um, it's really signed up to be like an hour talk and a half hour walk, but I think it's going to be more like 45 minute talk and then we'll just walk for the rest of the time. Um, we're all adults here. I always like to say, since I'm the adult educator. So if you guys have questions as we go, please just let me know. Um, and we can stop and pause and do some, some questions as we go. So my name is Lara Cazo and I am the adult programs teacher naturalist for the Metro South region of Mass Audubon. So the Metro South region consists of four sanctuaries, the Blue Hills Trailside Museum, which is the office that I work out of, but I also work with the Stony Brook Wildlife Sanctuary, uh, the Moose Hill Wildlife Sanctuary, and the Museum of American Bird Art Education Center as well. So all of those um, are in our area. I think we're closest to Stony Brook right here. Um, which is really nice. And if you haven't been there, I highly recommend it. They have an accessible boardwalk trail. So that's like really quite nice. Um, to go a little bit over my background, I have an undergraduate degree in wildlife biology from the University of Rhode Island. And that's actually where I got most of my herpetology knowledge. Herpetology is the study of reptiles and amphibians. So a lot of the information we're going to get today is from my experience there. But I have a master's degree from George Mason University um, down in D.C. in ornithology. So my background really is ornithology. I study birds. Um, so I can definitely answer lots of bird questions. This picture, I was a wildlife rehabber for a really long time, specifically with birds. Um, and I'm just giving water to a downy woodpecker in that picture. All right. So today we're going to talk about reptiles and there's really three parts that we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about what a reptile actually is, what defines a reptile, um, what reptiles live in Massachusetts. So the ones that you might possibly be able to see, there's quite a few of them. So I'm not going to be able to get into detail about every single one, but we're going to go over a couple and then how we can protect reptiles in Massachusetts, which is just going to be like a short little end portion of the talk. But to begin with, a reptile. Reptiles are vertebrates, meaning they have a spine. Um, these include snakes, lizards, crocodiles, and turtles. And they are distinguished by having dry, scaly skin, and they typically, not always, lay eggs, soft shell eggs on land. Not all of them lay soft shelled eggs. Crocodiles lay hard shelled eggs. Um, but for the most part, reptiles can follow this pattern of existence, basically. There's always exceptions to the rules. But there's four orders of reptiles, um, turtles, um, crocodiles, and alligators, both belong in the crocodilia family, uh, squama, squam, squamata, which is lizards and snakes, and then um, rhynchocephaliae, which I'm doing a bad job of pronouncing today because I'm talking too loud, fast, um, which is a very specific species known as the tuatara, which the tuatara only exists in New Zealand. New Zealand. It is the only animal of that order. And the tuatara is unique because it is the closest thing we have to dinosaurs. So it is the closest order related to dinosaurs. It like stopped evolving way before all the other orders. And it only really, it only exists in New Zealand and it's really unique because it has a third eyeball. You can't see it when you look at it, but on the top of its head, like right here, there's a eyeball actually. Um, doesn't have an eyeball like the ones you can see in this picture. It's more like a light sensitivity eye. Um, but that divides it separately from all the other reptiles. And we definitely don't have it here in Massachusetts. But I like to briefly mention it because when we're talking about reptiles, it is in its own order. Do you have a question? Is that third eye open and 
No, it's it, you can't even really tell that it's an eye. It just it's it almost looks like a a scale in the shape of an eye. So it doesn't open or close or anything like that. But it is an eye. But it's just for light sensitivity. It's kind of confusing. We don't totally understand how it works. All right. So reptile comes from the word repti to creep. Um, and these were categorized in the 13th century. This guy named Linnaeus, who is the biologist's worst nightmare. Linnaeus is the one that classified all the animals. Um, and originally amphibians and reptiles were all classified together because they were all considered kind of those creeping animals. Um, but oopsie, we really skipped ahead. Sorry. Come on. All right. Um, so originally they were all part of this egg laying creature family, snakes, various fantastic monsters, as they called them in the 13th century, lizards, amphibians, and worms were actually part of this family. <laughs> they couldn't figure out the differences between them. But eventually they categorized these guys very specifically to have distinct features, one of which is that they're all ectothermic or cold blooded. So animals that are cold blooded, like a snake, have body that ch um, have body temperatures that change with the outside environment. So if you put a snake somewhere cold, their internal temperature is going to be cold. If you put us somewhere cold, our internal temperature is still going to stay at 98 degrees, um, unless we're stuck out there and freezing to death, then it's going to go down. But a snake put in somewhere that's 30 degrees outside is going to be 30 degrees inside and could die depending on how low that gets. So this is just a little chart here that kind of shows that. So as the outside temperature increases, so does the animal's internal temperature when we're talking about these ectothermic animals. Just for a reference here, for an endothermic, that's what we are, we're warm-blooded mammals, the animal's internal temperature is going to stay pretty much consistent across the board, um, while the outside temperature is not going to have an effect on the internal temperature unless we get to like those heavy, heavy extremes um, like we're talking about in the Arctic or whatever if we're freezing. Reminder that this is Celsius, not um, Fahrenheit, so that's why it's like 30 degrees instead of 98.9. Another category of reptiles is they're going to have dry, scaly skin. Um, scales are actually called scoots. So each individual scale um, can also be known as a scoot, especially in turtles. Um, these guys are made up of keratin. So scales are pretty much made up of the same stuff that your fingernails are made up of, but stronger and a lot more of it. But it's still ker keratin that forms this uh, epidermis, just like our skin. Um, it sheds, our skin also sheds, you know, we, I, I like to use, you know, some of that, what is it called? Like the exfoliating bath salts, you know, <laughs> to get off all of our dry skin. These guys will shed it a little bit more. Um, and lizards and snakes especially will do that while turtles, um, might have like some dry flakes that come off, but it's just going to be a lot harder. It's just made of the same stuff as our fingernails and just a lot thicker patches. And then most have soft shelled eggs. So if we're thinking of eggs like a chicken egg, if we tap it with our fingernail, it's hard. The soft shelled eggs are squishy. You could actually like squish one and it wouldn't necessarily break right away. And that's basically because when we think of a chicken, um, they have a sharp beak. They actually have a, a little tooth when the chickens are very small, the chicks, that helps them crack through the egg. Uh, lizards and snakes and turtles don't really have that. So having a soft shelled egg that they can easily push out of um, allows these guys to hatch. And most reptiles have no um, parental care once they're born. Most of them, the eggs are laid and then they're neglected and they hatch themselves out and they're on their own. Actually, crocodiles are excellent mothers. Fun fact of the day in the reptile world. Um, well, we have these soft-shelled eggs. Another consideration, especially when we're talking about reptiles, is the concept of brumation, which is reptile version of hibernation. So this is the state or condition of sluggishness or inactivity that's seen by reptiles um, during winters. Um, it's kind of like this a state of torpor. Essentially, their metabolism gets really, really slow. They don't actually freeze, but their their blood 
um, their heart, everything slows down to such a slow rate that they're able to maintain like status quo essentially um, without much food, without actually a lot of oxygen and so on and so on. And so they can stay in this state throughout winter. Now people are like, can they, can they go like months and years at a time? And I'm like, no, even when we talk about hibernation, like bears, bears actually wake up and walk around and find a snack and then go back to sleep. These guys will do something similar, though a lot less actually snakes and turtles will pretty much burrow down and not move, um, though they will, you know, if it gets warm, if there's a warm day, they're going to wake up and move around. So we have brumation. Any questions about any of those things before I move on? Yes. No. So with, yeah, so they don't really molt like the snakes do. So the question was, do turtles have like a period of time where they like molt? Not really. It's, it's much more like our skin. So like flakes of keratin will kind of slowly start like falling off their shells. The snakes will lose all their skin at once. The turtles are going to have more like flaking coming off. And it's just like periodic, just like you lose your hair kind of. Mm. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, that can happen. That seems like a little dramatic, so I don't know. There's potential that like something was wrong and so he's shedding, but um, usually it's much smaller than that. Any other questions? I thought I saw another question. Okay, sounds good. All right, so let's talk about reptiles of Massachusetts. So to start off with, we don't have anything cool. That's just a lie. We have many, many cool things, but we don't have crocodiles. We don't have... Um, alligators, we definitely don't have tuatara, and we don't have any lizards, or at least we don't have any lizards anymore. Any that were here have been um, extinct in our area, so extirpated from our area. Um, so we only have turtles and snakes, and there's 10 species of turtle and 14 snakes that we have that are native to Massachusetts. There are a couple that are non-native that I'm gonna briefly mention as we go on. Um, and as you can see, 90% of the time, amphibians and reptiles are lumped together. They're very different in a lot of ways. And I do have a whole salamander talk um, that is one of my favorites to give. But today we're just gonna focus on those turtles and snakes, and I'm gonna go through them as we go on. So, turtles of Massachusetts. Now, we I love turtles, they're super weird. Um, and we have 10 different species of turtles here in Massachusetts. And if I went through every single one of them, we would be here for a really long time. In fact, I know that because when I was making this PowerPoint, I was like, I'm going to go through all of them. And then I was like, no, we're not. That's 24 animals. That's going to take way too long. Um, but we have 10 species, uh, the Blanding's turtle, the bog turtle, the diamondback terrapin, the eastern box turtle, the eastern musk turtle, the northern red-bellied cooter, the painted turtle, snapping turtle, spotted turtle, and wood turtle. <laughs> and they're all unique and they're all really cool. Because I don't have all the time in the world today, instead of going through all of them, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just focus on three snakes and three turtles and talk to you individually like about those individuals and I tried to pick like a variety of like kind of different ones that have different life histories um, but if you have questions about the other ones please feel free to ask so first of all I really like to share this picture because there's a lot of misunderstanding about turtles and their shells so to begin with turtles can't leave their shells um, it's not you know the fun boomerang channel cartoons where they can hop out of their shells, not Bugs Bunny. Um, they are locked in to their shells. Their vertebrate is part of the upper part of their shell. So their spine is fused with the shell and along with the rest of their bones. But all their important bits are inside the shell. Most of them also can't fully pull in to their shell. That is also a rumor some can. Box turtles actually have a hinged plastron. That's this bottom part here. So some of them have a hinge and can actually close it, pull their head inside and close it, but most can't. A lot of them can pull their legs and their head in, but it's still like kind of sticking out. They can't fully disappear inside their shell because inside is where all their guts and everything is. So they can't pull it all inside unless they have special features to do so. And most do not. This is something I love to show the kids because they just have no idea what to do with it. 
Um, but it's really interesting. Um, all turtles also have a tail and they have different attributes to their legs because some of them are really built for swimming and some of them are a lot more built for like walking on land. Pretty sure this is a box turtle shell. So you can see that the legs kind of look like they're made for walking. Some of them are going to be a lot more like out and splayed for pushing through water. Before I, um, continue, I briefly want to share this. This is um, a screenshot from the IUCN Red List page. So the IUCN Red List is basically the worldwide organization that determines the status of a species. So there's like a big committee that looks at how many of the species are left worldwide, so this is not state. So as I go through, I'm gonna mention some state statuses. But the red list really talks about worldwide and what the status is of all of the animals um, in determination for global conservation efforts. Um, so the real ones that you have to pay attention to are least concern, which means that we're not concerned that these animals are threatened, um, near threatened, vulnerable, endangered, critically endangered and extinct in the wild. Unfortunately, most reptiles are endangered. Um, most are threatened and we'll talk about some of the reasons for that as we go along. But it's just, I just like to share this because I do with all of these animals have their status listed on the slide. Um, and this is where I get the information from. All right, so I'm now gonna show you pictures of all the animals I'm not going to talk about in the turtle category. First up, box turtle. So this is a picture of the Eastern box turtle. These are the ones that you're probably gonna see on land if you ever see a turtle hanging out on land here in Massachusetts. The Eastern muck, musk turtle. I've never seen one of these in the wild. They mostly spend their time deep in muddy, boggy water. They're threatened due to water pollution. The red-bellied cooter, also never seen, highly threatened in this area. Painted turtle, the most common one. This is the one that you're gonna likely see on any waterway here in Massachusetts. The snapping turtle, really big guys. You can definitely see these if you go to the Stony Brook Wildlife Sanctuary. The spotted turtle, so it looks a lot like the painted turtle but covered in yellow spots. And the wood turtle, which is critically endangered uh, globally and very hard to find here in Massachusetts. But I'm gonna specifically talk about different turtles. I'm gonna specifically talk about the Blandings turtle. So these guys are found in the eastern half of the state. They're pretty big. They're pretty, they're decent sized turtles. Um, they're very long lived. They can live to almost 90 years of age. I think the oldest one was maybe like 83, 85. Um, and these guys in Massachusetts are listed as threatened under the Massachusetts Act. But globally, they're listed as an endangered species because animals don't really, they don't really listen to state borders. So if they're in the eastern part of Massachusetts, that means they can like go off into the other states as well. So globally, they're listed as endangered, but in Massachusetts, they're only considered threatened. That being said, um, you know, if you ever spot one of these guys, you're, you're asked to report it actually to the state. Their range is pretty small in our area. So if we look at Massachusetts over here, yes, they can be also found somewhat in New Hampshire, but we can see that there's this huge divide to the connections um, over here in Illinois, Michigan, and so on. These guys will mostly eat vegetation and spend most of their time in the water. They're so cute, aren't they? <laughs> Um, these guys will also get too hot and spend most of like the very hot times of the summer buried under leaf litter. And then in the winter, they'll spend their time at the bottom of ponds and the bogs down at the bottom. Um, they have a pretty rough time of it, like any turtle. Now this chart can be a little complicated to read if you don't, um, you know, it, it gets complicated. Essentially what this chart is saying is that for the first five years of life is the most dangerous time 
for the Blanding's turtle and any turtle. They're pretty small when they're hatched out. You know, I said they get to about this big. And once you're about this big, nothing's coming to get you. But when you're tiny, everything's after you. So when you're under the age of five and you're a turtle, you're very highly um, threatened. Once you get a little older, you know, you're going to survive probably for a lot longer. If you're a turtle and you reach 20, it's easy to reach 80. But if you're a turtle that's five, it's really hard to reach 10. So protecting these guys when they're small is really, really important. Um, and these guys don't actually reach the age of maturity as in uh, breeding age until they're 18. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just find that funny because humans too, um, hypothetically. Um, and some individuals don't even mate until they're 22 years of age, which is really, really old for animals, especially since you know, reaching the age of 22 is pretty challenging for these guys. You have to get past, you know, these really rough times and then you have to find another turtle to breed with and have more. So these guys are really endangered because most of them are dying very young, not reaching the age of maturity. And then even when they reach the age of maturity, there's not a lot of other ones for them to find to breed with. So this can be a really challenging existence for these guys. And they'll only have about like 10 babies. They'll lay like 18 eggs and maybe 10 of those will hatch. And then out of those 10, maybe one will have reached the age of maturity. Now, there is a lot of recovery programs for these guys. This one is specifically in Illinois. Um, the, turtle the Blanding Turtles Recovery Program. So they monitor the Blanding's turtles and to do this they catch them they give them measurements and they'll actually put little gps's on some of them in order to study where they go to keep track of them to see how old they get normally they're only catching them when they're a certain age because they're hard to find when they're really little um, and then they're basically keeping track of them where they're going and their survivorship just to keep a watch on these guys A lot of times, if they can, these guys will also collect eggs. So if they can find where, you know, a blanding turtle has laid the eggs, they'll actually dig them up, collect them and incubate them, and then release the babies just to make sure they survive. Because a lot of times, eggs themselves will get um, predated or destroyed while they're young. All right, so that was the Blanding's turtle. Brief little information. This is one of my favorite turtles here in Massachusetts. This is the Diamondback Terrapin. Super cool turtle that I don't think a lot of people know about. This is a coastal species that lives on mudflats and estuaries. Um, and these guys survive in high salty areas. And if they eat too much salt, they'll actually excrete the salt through their eyeballs. Very, very cool. <laughs> Um, and they're beautiful. Look at them. He's so pretty. Um, in world status, is these guys are vulnerable. So these guys are below endangered, but still threatened. In Massachusetts, these guys are considered threatened. Um, and with all of these, by the way, it's illegal to kill, harass, or collect these turtles. So any of the turtles that I've listed, it's actually illegal to take any part of them from the wild. Um, and these guys, especially because these guys are part of big recovery programs, but they're pretty cool. So these guys are the only species in America, um, in North America that spend its life solely in brackish water. So brackish is basically where the river meets the ocean. So it's fresh, but also salty. They can't survive in too salty water and they can't survive in too fresh water. They need the brackish water. And so you can see that their range pretty much extends along the coastline. It's kind of hard to see with this map, but what's actually happening in this map is the yellow is overlaying the actual line of the states. So they're like part on shore, part in the water. Um, they're most abundant in the tidal estuaries along the coast of Connecticut, the Connecticut River, um, and they're a little bit more tolerant to pollution and rising temperatures of the water. Um, but these guys are pretty threatened as well based because of habitat loss. So these guys do come up on the shore as always to lay eggs. They want really sandy areas, but they're not really coming up on the beaches. They're coming up on kind of strange along freshwater areas to dig and lay their eggs. 
Um, the adults nest on the sandy beaches, maybe in the marshy areas, um, and really do this from like June to July. Um, and because of changing temperatures, climate, human beings, a lot of these eggs are getting flooded or being destroyed and so on along those areas. These guys will dig a cavity that's like eight inches deep, actually, so pretty deep, lay their eggs in there, and it will take nine to 15 weeks for the edge, eggs to hatch, so quite a bit of time, and they're also very cute. Now, the Wetlands Institute has been a really big research and protection agency for these guys um, because these guys mostly get caught in crab traps a lot of the time or some fish traps. So there has been some development, you can see here, caught in a crab trap. And then the crab trap in the upper corner has a special turtle escape hatch. So the crabs get stuck, but the turtles get to leave. Um, but you know, not everyone uses this. And sometimes the turtles don't survive. If a turtle is caught in one of those crab traps, they are put back, but they don't necessarily survive just being caught in the trap. So that can be really detrimental to them as well. Um, other things that they're doing is these guys can also get often get hit by cars because there's so many roads along coastal ways. And these guys are crossing past the beaches up into like the dirt sandy areas. Um, people have put up kind of <laughs> turtle roadblocks here and there's even special places especially during breeding season that there are people who patrol along the roads just to make sure the turtles make it to the other side but cars are a huge problem for them these guys are also radio tagged as we can see this tiny baby one in the corner is radio tagged and then there are special and i think there's a name for it does it say it here i think it's called like a, a turtle garden um, you can see in the top picture, all of those little fences are where there's turtle eggs underneath. So this is like an area that they like have discovered that the turtles will go to and they entice the turtles to also come. So if they find one on a road, they'll just put it here um, and then they keep track. And the little fences actually have a roof to prevent birds and other predators from getting to those eggs. So the Dimeback Terrapins, um, let's see if my video will work. not going to watch the whole thing, but we'll watch a minute or two of this. I've been coming to Long Beach Island for about 21 years. I'm Lisa Dolan, and I'm here in my garage with 500 of my closest little turtle friends here. So I've always been interested in turtles. I was introduced to Kathy Lacey uh, four years ago. As it progressed, I got to meet more and more of the women who were actually going to be working on this project. And I think overall we just have a common love of these little guys. This is the front yard. We have a natural nesting site here in my yard. So these guys are hatched in my front yard. They go into the garage and then they go into the bay. Because this whole area, it used to be all beach and this was where all the turtles laid their eggs. And now everybody's got the hardscaping or the stones and it's just not conducive to the eggs remaining healthy and hatching. These are the hatcheries. This is where we put our nests when we pull them from people's yards where they couldn't incubate naturally. They're either laid in poor substrate or they're in dangerous areas where the predators would dig them up. If the raccoons don't get them, the crows will get them. If the crows don't get them, the fox will get them. People also walk right over where the nest has been laid and they'll crush the eggs. We actually have an issue with sometimes people hitting them on purpose. That's the hardest part is when you see something like that happening. The most enjoyable part of the project for me is getting the community involved. One of the ways that we've done this is through our adopt a nest program. This is where families can come and adopt a nest and release the babies. I think at this point uh, I've seen more of the adults excited than, than the kids. Whenever you would hand an adult a turtle and they would say, oh, can I release a turtle? And you could see the excitement on, on their face. And they're so cute. All right. I, I, for, we don't have time to watch the whole thing. But you can find that. That's just on YouTube. So definitely check it out. Um, so that's the Dimeback Terrapin. And they're they're a favorite here in Massachusetts. And they're, they're very, very cool. Yeah. That I think, um, let me see. I think I have the link listed. 
I don't. Um, I'm pretty sure that's in Connecticut as well. Um, but I've done some Diamondback Terrapin stuff in Rhode Island, and I know that it's in Massachusetts. That video was just the best one I could find. Um, just ma mostly it was just the well-made video. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, Mass Audubon does that on the Cape too. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Um, very cool. They're very cool. So you can definitely try to volunteer for some of those pro projects as well if that's something you're interested in. Um, the last turtle I want to speak about is the rarest turtle in the state. It's the Eastern Bog Turtle. Um, these guys are under threat from habitat loss and from collection for the pet trade. So I haven't mentioned this really yet, but collection for the pet trade is the biggest threat, um, to reptiles. And it's the second biggest threat actually to all animals in the world. Um, it's a huge industry and, um, the illegal pet trade is right next to, um, the drug and weapons trade in list of things that make the most money illegally, which is shocking when you think about it. But a lot of the time, um, it's right up there with illegal weapons and the drug trade. So it makes a ton of money. So these guys are, um, threatened for that. These guys also live in bogs and other wetland areas. And we don't have a lot of bogs in Massachusetts and most of them have been destroyed destroyed. So these guys are listed as critically endangered. Essentially, that means um, that they're even more endangered than endangered <laughs> and that they are um, on the verge of being extinct in the wild. So in Massachusetts, these guys are listed as endangered. Federally, they're threatened, but worldwide, they're critically endangered. And it's, again, illegal to harass or basically touch this turtle <laughs> in general. <laughs> These guys have a pretty narrow range. Um, so they're up along the East Coast. You can see here, they're really out in the Western part of Massachusetts. So you're not really gonna see them over here, um, down in through Jersey. And then there's a separate Southern population in the Southern part of Virginia. Um, and the Southern populations and the Northern populations have like a 250 mile gap between them. So they don't really overlap at all. And some people consider them like subspecies of each other. Um, these guys are North America's smallest turtle. They only grow to be about like four inches. So they're very, very tiny. And they live in these very sp specific habitats. Um, they really need mountain bog habitat. So that is a bog in the mountains. We don't have a lot of that here, which is why they're in West Virginia. Um, which if you have ever been to the West Virginia mountains, absolutely stunning, lots of amphibians and reptiles there um, because these guys want the higher altitudes and the mountain bogs are really important for so many ecological reasons. Um, but they're also home to plants like the green pitcher plant, a sweet pitcher plant, swamp pink and bunched arrowhead, which are a bunch of really important plants for this turtle specifically. So we don't have a lot of this habitat in Massachusetts just to start with. And a lot of it has been destroyed as people build more housing, like housing as the trails are built and so on. So we're losing a lot of the habitat for these guys. And again, the pet trade is, is really um, a problem. In fact, it's such a problem that if a picture was taken like this, this one, let's say out at a bog, um, and someone took this picture and tagged the location, instantly you have now given poachers the place where they can find this turtle and they will find your post and they will find the turtle. So my advice to anybody with any animal is if you take pictures of it, totally fine. Never tag a location unless it's on iNaturalist and even then don't do it for reptiles. Never tag location of reptiles because you'll get um, things like this. These guys are also really highly studied. Um, but a lot of it again is kind of secretive because they don't want people to know where these guys are. Um, but I have a very short video from the nature conservancy on these guys that I'd like to share as well, because it talks a lot more about these guys, uh, than I am going to. And this is in Massachusetts, this video specifically. Cool. 
a little blurry. I've always loved wildlife and I've always dreamed of a job that I could hair for wildlife in a way that had a meaningful impact. Bog turtles are one of the smallest terrestrial turtles in North America. They are a federally threatened species, meaning they do get protection under the Endangered Species Act. Less than about 150 turtles probably exist in Massachusetts. There's only two known populations left, but then nationally, they're very rare as well. Bog turtles are endangered for a number of reasons, primarily just habitat loss. So as people move in and as invasive species move in and change the hydrology and water quality, it messes with the habitat availability that they have. So take away the places that they can live and their populations are going to decrease. You're not allowed to have them as a pet because they are a federally threatened species, but they definitely have a threat in terms of poaching for the pet trade. And because of that, we keep the locations of our sites very secret. You got her over there. Yeah, she's over here. And so there is a federal recovery plan to try to bring them out of that threatened status. And so we work closely with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service as well as our state agency partners to make sure that we're doing our part to protect the species, not just in Massachusetts, but range-wide throughout the country. What we have going on right now is marker capture studies to be able to find as many turtles as possible each spring. Oh, I got another one. And that data will be entered into a statistical model that will give us an estimate of the adult population size. And then we're also using radio transmitters that are affixed onto the shell of the turtle. And we've been tracking several animals' movements weekly for the last three years. 135 because of the rain, so he got pushed way downstream. And that's going to give us information about kind of where the turtles like to hang out. And are we making the right habitat conditions for them? Are we creating new areas and they like those areas and they're going into those areas and exploring them? I would say 108. If we can find um, that the turtles are using more areas that we have restored, and if we can find that there are more turtles than we originally thought, that will be a great success for the species. And especially in Massachusetts, it's been a really amazing legacy of a lot of um, dedicated women and scientists that have you know, made this project happen out here. And so my hope is that we, we continue that you know, generation on and that the organizations can sustain that work and the bog turtles will need less and less help over time because the population will be stable enough. So a fun little turtle um, that not many people know about here in Massachusetts. Really quickly, because we're not going to end at 145 because I just keep talking. Um, the red-eared slider is really popular. You can find this guy everywhere here in Massachusetts. And he is um, an invasive species. So we do have an invasive species of turtle. Um, this guy is actually native to the Midwest and northern Mexico. But the problem with this turtle is that it was a popular pet that was then released into the wild up here. And it takes over the habitat of um, the spotted turtles and the painted turtles here in Massachusetts. So basically it um, takes over where it doesn't belong and then it the spotted turtles and painted turtles lose their habitat and can't survive because the red-eared sliders are just better at living there. Um, so what this map basically shows is all the yellow part here is where they're supposed to be, their range. All the blue dots is where they actually are. And most of these have gotten there through the pet trade and just being released into the wild. And then finally, very briefly, we do get sea turtles here in Massachusetts, but none of them are considered Massachusetts turtles. These guys just occasionally end up here. Um, we have the Kemp's Ridley turtle, the loggerhead turtle, the green turtle, the leatherback turtle, and the Atlantic hawksbill turtle. All of these guys are pretty much endangered um, or threatened or vulnerable. Um, and we only really see these when they end up on the, the coast for, I don't know, chilling reasons. So we don't really have sea turtles, but we can see them sometimes here in Massachusetts. The leatherback, especially the one at the top, um, injured ones have washed up on the shore of Massachusetts and gone to rehabilitators that then have released them again. All right. So snakes. I love snakes. Does anyone else love snakes? <laughs> 
one person, a couple people. I love snakes. I think snakes are so cool. Yeah, I know most people don't really like snakes, so don't worry. Um, because also because I talk too much and we'll run out of time. I'm only going to talk about two species of snakes, really. Um, but we do have tons of snake species here in Massachusetts. Um, we have 14 different species. I definitely can't go through all of them. But just a couple here. We have the worm snake, the ribbon snake, the brown snake, the milk snake. Uh, I think that's the northern brown snake. And snakes also have really interesting physical structure. They basically are just all ribs, which is pretty interesting. They're basically a head and ribs and then a tail. And all their organs are in between these many, many, many ribs. Um, so they can actually be injured pretty easily. You know, stepping on one of them is really going to hurt them. Don't step on snakes, guys. Um, they're so cute, trust me. Um, and they have their vulnerable organs basically right in the middle. For those of you that are scared of snakes, don't worry because most snakes can't eat anything bigger than the widest part of their body. So whatever the widest part of their body is, is about the max size of whatever they can eat. So those, you know, boa constrictors that eat gazelles, not true. That can't actually happen. It's much too big for them. They can eat things slightly bigger than them, especially when we get to the really big snakes, but most snakes can't eat anything wider than the largest part of their body. But snakes do have a very interesting special organ called the Jacobson's organ. So snakes don't have a sense of smell like we do. We smell the olfactory nerves, transmit that to our brain for information. Snakes don't even have great eyesight. In fact, their eyesight is really bad. But what they do have is the tips of their tongue, very special, can pick up air particles and scent particles. So their tongue flicks out and they're picking up scent particles on the air, it's sticking to their tongue, and then they're pulling it back inside and it hits that organ at the top of their head called the Dr Jacobson's organ. And that translates the chemicals, the smell chemicals into basically visions, like basically what's the environment around them. So they're seen with smell. So they may, you know, pick up some dirt, smell chemicals and air and tree and human and so they get a picture of like kind of what's around them they do also have eyes so they can kind of see but their vision's pretty bad and their sense of smell is really based on this organ that translates it into kind of sight it's really interesting okay we have 14 species of snake native to massachusetts I will run through these very, very quickly. We have black rat snake, decays brown snake, eastern garden snake, eastern black racer, eastern hognose snake, eastern milk snake, ribbon snake, eastern worm snake, northern copperhead, northern red belly snake, northern water snake, ring neck snake, smooth green snake, and timber rattlesnake. All of them live here. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and we don't have any invasives here in Massachusetts in terms of snakes. I'm going to go through, I think I'm just going to do two snakes. I'm going to try to squeeze in three, but I love to show those videos and they take up a little bit of time. But my favorite snake here in Massachusetts is the Eastern hognose snake, um, mostly because these guys are weird looking. Um, these guys are named for their upturned nose and they have this brown, black, yellow coloration. You can see these guys in this area. My brother's actually seen them in uh, Somerville before. Um, and these guys are really harmless snakes. Um, in fact, they're ridiculous snakes and they will play dead because they're scared of you. They have two things that they're going to do to protect themselves. These guys um, will eat mice and rats, but they really prefer toads. So not scary. They, they just like to eat the little toads in your backyard. And I love this picture because look at, look at it, guys. It's pretty cute. It has a little nose. That's adorable. So hognose snake because it has kind of like a nose like a pig. Um, they're found in the eastern half of the United States down to Florida. And they're also found in southern New Hampshire, um, but not really higher than southern New Hampshire. They're not really in Vermont or Maine at all. Um, and they're mostly found in woodlands, and they like the sandy soil and coastal areas. Um, so kind of woodlands along the coastal regions is where you're going to find them. But then again, they're also like all over in um, the mid-Atlantic. So you're going to find them in like sandy areas out there. And they're really ridiculous. And they will play dead 
when they get scared. And they will be really dramatic about it. And I highly recommend you look this up on your own time. Um, look up a hognose snake playing dead because they will dramatically flail themselves backwards and like pretend to faint and be like, oh Lord, it's coming. And like really just quite dramatic and pretend they're dead. Kind of like a possum, but possums just fall over. These guys, very dramatic about it. Their other defense and this is a video, but it's like two seconds long, is they can puff their heads out to make them look flat and they look like a rattlesnake and they hiss to sound like a rattle. But really look at it, it's so cute. <laughs> so they'll pretend to be a rattlesnake also to scare you away because they really don't have much defense at all. So their defense is to play dead or pretend to be a rattlesnake. Speaking of rattlesnakes, we do have one here in Massachusetts. It's the timber rattlesnake, and it is highly endangered. Um, but these guys used to be a lot more prevalent around New England. Um, but they were mostly um, exterminated by people killing them because they didn't want these guys around, which is quite sad, actually, because they do have a really important part of the ecosystem. Um, that has been pretty much neglected because there's not as many of them around. Uh, so mice and rat infestations, we need these guys. Um, they're extremely rare and extremely localized in areas. Um, prefers only rocky forested areas. So you're really only going to find these guys if it's a really, really rocky, steep area, which most people don't really tend to go in anyway. Um, it's endangered in Massachusetts and globally, and it's really illegal to kill one of these guys. You can get in a lot of trouble if you're found to have killed a timber rattlesnake. So this map, real briefly, the yellow, which I know they use yellow and orange, horrible colors, but the yellow is the historic range, and you can see that it extends a little further, while the orange is the current range. So these guys used to extend a lot further and it's been much more narrowed down. And what this map doesn't show is we're talking like pockets of areas where these guys are. Um, so again, they're Southern New Hampshire. Anything above New Hampshire is too cold for most reptiles. Um, this is changing with climate change, but you know, nothing above New Hampshire. Um, and they're found through Appalachia pretty much, but not really anywhere else. But these guys um, need these rocky areas and I couldn't really find a great picture of one like in the rocky areas, but I'm talking like the big boulders stacked on top of each other with the crags that they can hide in like this. So they're really in those areas. Um, they're not gonna be just hanging out on the forest floor. They're not gonna be near like the top of the mountains, they're going to be in the rocky places and they don't care about you and they want you to stay away from them. So the thing about rattlesnakes is that the reason they have a rattle is because they don't actually want to bite you. Biting you is a waste of their time and energy. Yes, they are venomous, but the thing is, is if they bite you, they have to regenerate that venom and they probably need it for something more useful if something comes along to attack them. So the rattle is to tell you to back off because they don't actually want to bite you. If they wanted to, they wouldn't have the rattle. The rattle is a warning sign to get away. They're very, very scared of you um, and they don't wanna waste their energy on you pretty much. Um, now the venom is enough to kill a human. That being said, the snake bites are extremely rare even when there were a lot more of them because again, they don't want to bite you and most people fully recover from rattlesnake bites if they're treated. So you can fully recover um, if you do ever get bit. Um, pretty much you make sure that wherever part was bit is below your heart. You can do like the tie off to make, the, make sure your blood is flowing a little bit slower and go to the emergency room. And most people are completely fine afterwards. So timber rattlesnakes, and that's all rattlesnakes in the U.S., by the way. The, the snakes you have to watch out for are going to be in the tropics and Australia. Those are the ones you have to be scared of. These guys, just be cautious. And fun fact, these guys are actually excellent mothers. So I talked about how most reptiles, their eggs hatch, and then they're just like, goodbye, 
live your life uninterested. The rattlesnake mothers will actually wait and protect the eggs. They'll guard the eggs. And then when the babies are born, they're not going to help them catch food or teach them how to be a snake, but they are going to hang around and make sure that the babies have survived and can go off on their own, which is a lot more than most mothers in the reptile world do. So these guys are actually good mothers. And even in this picture, you can kind of see that they're underneath a large rock. So these rocky, scraggly areas. And finally, since we do have a little bit of time and since I started a little late, I'm going to talk about the Eastern Garter Snake because this is the most common snake in Massachusetts and most people have seen this snake. And it is also the official reptile of Massachusetts. So yes, we do have an official reptile of Massachusetts and it is the Garter Snake. Um, and just for clarification, it is Garter because these guys have stripes that people thought looked like garters. Um, we don't really wear those anymore, um, but it isn't garden snake. A lot of people mistakenly call this a garden snake, but it is a garter snake because of those stripes that look like garter stockings. And these guys are super prevalent throughout the state. Now, this is a screenshot from iNaturalist. I'm happy to talk about that a little bit more another time, but this is where people can log sightings of animals. Garter snakes are least concerned, not threatened, um, not really picked up for the pet trade. So people do log the information of them on here. I personally try not to log anything, but that's a personal choice. But this can be a really good um, website to find animals if you're curious about them. Um, so these guys are really common throughout the state um, and are not actually protected through most of the state. So in general, these guys are not as protected, but as an overarching blanket statement, you're not supposed to hunt or kill any reptile. So take that as you will with how laws work. But they're also pretty prevalent throughout the United States in general. They prefer mo moist, grassy environments. So that's why they're found a lot of times in people's gardens. Um, they like ponds, lakes, ditches near stream edges. However, they're not always near water sources. They can be in a lot drier areas where it just will rain and they'll be perfectly happy with that as well. These guys are going to eat a variety of strange things, including, including earthworms. So again, that garden snake reputation, frogs, lizards, not here, um, and mice. Um, and they are, um, Again, the one like really going to find these guys basking in the sun because, again, they spend a lot of time in the grasses, which the grass is cold, dirt is cold. So they're going to spend a lot of time on rocks. And these guys bro do brumation. And for people who don't like snakes, let me tell you, you don't ever want to find one of these places. So these guys will all hibernate or brumate together. And Here really, in the inner lake region, the limestone I don't really bedrock. Because I'm just going to tell you about it. Um, these guys will all like hibernate together, and then all start coming out together at the same time. So they're all going to be underground in these like special hibernation caves, and then they're all going to come out at the same time. And if you don't like snakes, you don't want to be here. Um, this is a really um, fun video from National Geographic. It's called, If You're Scared of Snakes, Don't Watch This. Um, but it talks about these like giant, yeah, so basically, look away if you don't like it. They come out in these huge, huge groups. Um, I'm personally like, yeah, let's go. Uh, but I understand why people don't want to. All right, really quickly, lastly, let's talk about some threats to reptiles in Massachusetts. So I briefly mentioned all of the ones we're going to go over. Um, timber rattlesnakes. Um, if there are timber rattlesnakes in an area that are actually going to be an issue, which is like nowhere, but you will see these DCR signs telling you that they might be there. But most of the time, even if they're around, no one's going to mention it because they don't want people coming and killing them. And because the likelihood of you ever seeing one is so low, their numbers are so low to begin with. There's just not a lot of them around. Um, one could be found somewhere and never seen again. So unless there's actually a sign, the likelihood is there's no timber rattlesnakes in the area. Um, that was just a random little point about timber rattlesnakes, but threats to reptiles in Massachusetts. The number one threat worldwide for any animal, it doesn't matter, mammal, bird, whatever, whatever, whatever. The number one threat is habitat 
Uh, I wrote protection, but it's habitat degradation. So there is not enough habitat protection and most habitats are being destroyed. So this map shows um, in red the highest areas where biodiversity is threatened. So California is really bad. Um, it's harder to see up in our area because we do have a lot of land protection, but it's not enough. Um, habitat loss is the biggest thing to all animals on the planet. For reptiles, road mortality is really, really big. Um, so a lot of these guys are trying to cross habitat, stop, break for turtles, break for snakes, and so on. Um, and a lot of them, especially out actually in places like um, Arizona and Nevada with the big long roads, the snakes will be crossing and often get hit by cars. Like I mentioned before, the illegal pet trade is huge and reptiles are highly, highly, highly affected by it. Invasive species such as our red-eared slider can be a very large problem taking over habitat of the other ones. And water pollution and trash pickup is a huge one for reptiles here as well. Water pollution for the turtles like the musk turtles or the Blandings turtles that live most of their time in the water. Water pollution is just such a big problem. It makes it hard for them to live and breathe and catch their food. And then trash litter is just in general a large problem. But for turtles especially, it can really mutate um, their shells and so on if they get trapped in it young. So essentially though, what you can do to help is to not, to try to do not all of those things. So break for turtles, um, pick up your litter, make sure that if anyone you know is thinking about getting a pet reptile, that it's from a really reputable source and no, I don't know what those are. Um, but you can find them. <laughs> But just be really careful if you're ever looking to own a reptile that you're finding it from a place that the animal was never taken from the wild and you watch to see the status of that animal in general. Leaving leaf litter can be really important as well because a lot of them hibernate under the leaf litter. Um, volunteering for various things can be really good as well. We can see like turtle volunteering is really important. Some people get really into um, snake pit tagging. So tagging snakes is actually a thing. I didn't have any pictures of it, but you can put little, I've done this, you catch the snakes and then you actually put a little GPS under their scales so you can track them. And then this is the 50th anniversary of the Endangered Species Act. So basically what that is saying is go out and make sure that you are uh, voting for legislation that continues to protect these animals. And that is everything I have today for you on the rare world of reptiles in Massachusetts. So thank you guys so much. And any questions, I'm happy to answer now. Yes. I was down in Texas visiting my daughter. And mm -hmm. I was sitting on a deck. Uh -huh. and this little reptile came walking across, and he puffs up his orange chest. Oh, yeah, so lizards. <laughs> I have no idea. It's so cute. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so lizards are their own category, and I'd love to talk about lizards, but we don't really have any here in Massachusetts. But lizards have a lot of interesting, like, protective measures, just like our, our hog nose snake that does some, like, really bizarre things to protect itself. That's a protection measure. Or it's just like, look at me, I'm really hot. You should have my babies to other lizards. Yeah. Are you familiar with the Jersey Shore? Under Atlantic City, all the way down to Cape May. In terms of... Turtles come from there to get to the ocean, but then they come back and they cross the street and they lay their eggs. And actually, they have signs posted mm -hmm. all along. They have, yeah. They have a, a turtle I don't know anything specific about that area. Um, I can tell you a lot about bird protection. Um, <laughs> so much about bird protection, which they do have. Um, but in general, like people who love turtles, like turtles. Um, um, turtles is why plastic straws are illegal. 
um, because of that one image of the plastic straw and the image of the turtle I just showed. And there's lots of images of plastic affecting turtles. Um, it's just, it just makes a great marketing picture. Um, so people love turtles. And so there is a lot of protection in certain areas for turtles. And just in general, I will say the East coast and the West coast are pretty good about managing those things. Um, if we consider education status and wealth status of areas, the places that have a little bit more are going to have more time and energy and wealth to do those protection measures. Um, so places like that are definitely going to be higher up. So the Cape is really good. Um, some places in the Jersey shore are really good and down the coast coastal areas are, are highly protected and people know to protect them. It's, it's, a lot of the times, like if we're talking about that turtle out in the West or these timber rattlesnakes that people just don't like are the ones that don't get as much protection, but there is a lot for things on the coasts. Like the coasts get a lot of attention, even if it's not enough. And I'm just going to say point blank, it's still not enough, but they do get a lot more attention. Other questions. I lived in Western Australia with the Navy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We had, I'm a nurse. Mm -hmm. I worked at the hospital. There were 20 anti-venoms. Yes. Yeah. Australia wants to kill you. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, I, I studied, I studied and lived in New Zealand for a little bit. New Zealand's great. Nothing wants to kill you in New Zealand. Awesome. You go to Australia, everything wants to kill you. Yes. I have a bird question. Yes, a bird question. Sunday, I was in Fall River, so I didn't really know who to call. Yeah. There was a bird, I couldn't even tell, it kind of was this big and black and fluffy. Mm -hmm. It had been hit by a car. Mm -hmm. And it was laying there kind of looking at me when I got to that Yeah. Car. So, yeah, so here is um, the thing that I do with all the children. What do you do if you find a wild animal that's been injured? Does anyone know? This is the question for the children. Does anyone know? Yes. Yes, but there's a step before that. Don't touch it. <laughs> Do not touch it. Whatever you find, don't touch it. Now, birds specifically, okay, don't touch it, but not, they're not going to give you as many diseases as if it's a mammal. But first, you should call. Animal control is pretty good. Wildlife rehabs are better. So you can find the list of all the wildlife rehabs in the area, and you can call them. You can call animal control. You can even call a vet. And they're going to first tell you what to do, which is either going to be don't touch it and leave it there or put it in a box. Those are going to be your options and bring it somewhere. Um, without knowing the specific situation, it's really hard to say. But Massachusetts has a pretty wide wildlife rehabber distribution and you can actually find the list online and then it gives you a bunch of phone numbers you can call tufts university has a big wildlife rehab and then rhode island has a huge rehabilitator network and i actually worked there when i was at uri so don't touch it and call someone are the first first steps I had a herpetology class with a professor at URI, and she was really cool. <laughs> that was pretty much how I got interested in reptiles. Yeah, and then birds I got interested in because I took the ornithology class, and they were like, what bird is that? And I said, that's a kingfisher. And he said, you did an excellent job. And I guess I just took that as that was what I was going to do for the rest of my life. Yes. Yeah, maybe we'll see one today. Yes, northern water snakes, they're the worst. They're going to bite you the most. They're not venomous, but they do bite a lot. Don't recommend. Also, though, like I've been bitten by a bunch of black rat snakes before. It's not even as bad as a cat bite, but, you know, don't, don't pick them up on, anyway. <laughs> but, yeah, the northern water snakes, very big, very brown, very aggressive. Yeah. So it's better, well, a snapping turtle, I'm going to recommend you use a stick. Um, if you do have to pick up the turtle, especially like if it's like a lot of traffic, they're kind of not as smart. Um, and sometimes it is legitimately easier to pick it pick it up and move it because it might take you a really long time to get them across the road without picking them. Don't pick up a snapping turtle. They will bite your finger off. You worried about timber rattlesnakes? No, no, no. 
you worry about snapping turtles, okay? Um, they're going to take off your fingers. So a snapping turtle, you get a stick and you push them from behind. They're also like bigger and more aware of their surroundings. If you find a tiny turtle, you're going to pick it up like a hamburger, okay? Like a hamburger and bring it to the other side of the road. Um, don't put your fingers near its face. If you don't have to pick it up, don't. But if you have to, because sometimes those are the best ways to just move it quickly, especially across a roadway, I'm not going to tell you not to, but don't pick up a snapping turtle. If you go to Johnson Middle School, there's a pond in there, and the kids from the Johnson made a sign, beware. Yeah. Yes. Snapping turtles are big. Any other questions before we go on our little walk? Yeah. I rescued a good-sized turtle last week. Nice. Yeah, and I kept it up. Yeah. Yep. Do you know what kind? Was it a snapping turtle? I don't think it was. Was it yellow on the bottom? Yes. So you found a Blanding's turtle. You should report that. If it was yellow on the bottom, it is probably a blanding turtle, and they're pretty decent sized, which is why that was my initial thought. Um, these guys with the yellow on the bottom, um, they will hiss at you to tell you I'm really scary. Um, you also like, just don't get bit by turtles. They have like beaks. It's not a great idea. But if you found one of these guys, um, you, you should actually report it to the, I don't know, that's the one in Illinois. I will find you the link, but there's a place on, um, the Massachusetts DCR board because they want to track these guys because they're super endangered and you should actually report where you saw it. It's of course now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, if you don't have a picture, it didn't happen is pretty much a big thing in wildlife. So if you ever find one, do take a picture. But you should m make a note of that. And um, if you think it was this guy and put it in there. Like to, to identify the species. They're pretty unique looking, all the turtles that we have, except for our painted. Where's my picture? and the red-eared slider. Um, they're all pretty unique when you just look at them. So photos are really useful. The ones that you're gonna run into a little bit of trouble with are gonna be the painted turtle, the red-eared slider, and this red-bellied guy. I picked really dramatic pictures. So sometimes the red belly is not this distinct. Um, but everybody else is pretty unique looking. So the spotted turtle, the wood turtle has an extremely orange belly. Uh, the box turtle is going to be very, like, you know, dome-shaped on top. And the snapping turtle, I mean, I don't know. It looks insane. <laughs> I don't know what else to say about that guy. Um, but, yeah, pretty much all the turtles have unique features. It's just when you get into the guys that are pretty similar in the terms of their face that you have that you get tr that you get problems yeah the spotted turtle it's very very pretty all right i'm happy to continue to answer questions but i want to make sure we get some time to go on a little half hour walk just down the trail um it's not sunny which might affect our ability to find any reptiles but for you know a good half hour i'm happy to walk along the trail answer any questions with anyone who wants to join but thank you so much for joining us today um, I hope you enjoyed and learned something.